What I remember about that morning was being awoken from a sound sleep with what I describe as an explosion in my head. Suzanne Peterson thought a blood vessel in her head popped the morning of August 3rd, but it was a bullet. Her husband shot her as she lay sleeping. He expected her to die, but instead she got up. Then I ran to him and uh, he didn't seem concerned about what was happening to me, so I ran towards the telephone to call the ambulance and I was hit with what I thought at the time was another explosion in my head. Suzanne's second explosion was another bullet, this time in her back. It left her paralyzed from the waist down. While she lay bleeding, her husband was upstairs getting ready for work. And then he came downstairs and looked at the front door, told me the ambulance was on, was on its way, and then he shut the door and he left the house and got in his car and drove away. Suzanne crawled to her balcony and yelled for help. She still didn't think she'd been shot by her husband. She found out later at the hospital. They came to the table I was laying on and told me that I had been shot through the head and through the back. And I was shocked. And I said something at the time about my husband must have something to do with this. The two bullets are still inside Suzanne. One is lodged behind her right eye, leaving her blind. The other bullet is lodged in her vertebrae. It took a jury only three hours to find Suzanne's husband, Charlie, guilty of attempted murder. Apparently, he did it to collect insurance money. He denies shooting Suzanne. He says a burglar did it. I've commented that I would go to jail for him if I could have my legs back. There is no just punishment while he's on earth. But I do hope he gets a very stiff, the maximum sentence, so that he can live the rest of his life in jail. Suzanne now tackles life one day at a time. She says some days she thinks there must be a special reason why she didn't die. And some days, she says, she's just angry it happened. For Newswatch 7 at 10, I'm Molly Miller. Suzanne's husband could get up to 70 years in prison. His sentencing date is scheduled for early May. Michael, the wife of a slain Desert Storm soldier, has a court... It's a typical Easter morning for the Knutson family and friends. If all the servers would go to the tables and take a good look at what's there. Can I need some paddles? Hovering in the family restaurant kitchen like bees, the crew, family members and volunteers turn out pizza and pasta. We'll, we'll try and seat you at the same table or close to each other. The guests are greeted at the door, hundreds of needy people who've stopped by for a free Easter lunch. Many have stood in line for more than an hour. And we believe in Jesus' concept that you feed the poor and the hungry and you take care of each other. And he has blessed us so much. And we just feel that this is one of the ways, we do many things, but this is one of the ways that we say, thank you, Lord, for all you've given our family. The volunteers have cooked up about 200 pounds of mastacholi, some 500 pounds of red sauce, and they'll cook about 200 pizzas. Helping pop pizza in the oven is volunteer Ron Byloff. He's only missed one Easter since the Knudsen started doing this seven years ago. I'd say sharing is what Easter's probably about and caring about other people. The guests were treated as family. This woman was serenaded with the birthday song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I think this is good in here for the family that needs to be with the family to come in here and have some place for people to be. Cupcakes dressed in Easter colors were served up for dessert, and even as guests left, they were handed dyed eggs. Just another Easter day for the Knutsons and friends. In Lincoln, for Newswatch 7 at 10, I'm Molly Miller. And here in Omaha. Good evening. A fishing trip at a lake south of Fremont, Nebraska, ended tragically tonight. A 21-year-old man drowned after his canoe capsized. Newswatch 7's Molly Miller was at the scene and files this report. Mike Wolf's canoe lay beached on the shores of Lake Olmsted while divers searched for his body. The 21-year-old apparently lost control in his canoe on the windy lake. Three witnesses saw Wolf fall into the lake from his canoe. He'd come here after work to go fishing early this morning. When he hit this cold water, it's 44 degrees. Uh, the shock of that uh, just probably caused him to go down right away. Wolf's sister was at the lake and visibly shaken to find out her brother's body was located. 
About 50 volunteers, mostly firefighters, and two teams of divers helped drag the lake. Murky water made the search tough. Close your eyes and that's what you see. It's just like I say, all with your hands, just feel around until you find what you need. Wolf was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, and the icy waters likely disorientated him as he tried to swim to shore. It took rescue workers nine hours to locate his body. He wasn't wearing a life jacket. We hope it's not going to be a long summer of this. Near Fremont, for Newswatch 7 at 10, I'm Molly Miller. Four people, including a... 31-year-old Cecilia Dietschold's remains were discovered last August. Two fishermen found her bones taped up in a sleeping bag along the banks of the Missouri River. Cecilia disappeared from her home back in November 1987. Autopsy results show she died from fractures to the entire left side of her skull. Her husband, 34-year-old Clark Dietschold, has been charged with second-degree murder. He was in court today for a bond hearing. He was questioned uh, three or four years ago and has been questioned uh, several times over the past few years, so I don't think this came as a surprise. He's remarried and has a pregnant wife and he has a good job and uh, he uh, denies the charge uh, vigorously. Officials admit Dietschold has been a longtime suspect, but say it took a lot of investigating after finding the body before they could make an arrest. Body not being located until August of 1990. The investigation did not... Uh initiate until that point in time until we found the body. Documents obtained by Channel 7 say neighbors heard screams from the Dietschold house the night Cecilia disappeared and then they saw Dietschold's pickup leave. Dietschold is a recreation planner for the Army Corps of Engineers and today his co-workers weren't talking much about the case. I had heard that the cops were investigating him but I, I didn't know him personally or anything about him. I, I don't know him at all. Dietschold will soon be free on bond. His preliminary hearing is scheduled for later this month. In Plattsmouth, for Newswatch 7 at 6, I'm Molly Miller. Miller has been watching the strike today. She joins us now live. And Molly, it sounds like the unions are very well organized here. Michael, they are. You know, there's many unions involved in this, and they've set up local strike headquarters throughout the city of Omaha. They're ready for a long strike. They don't want one. You know, the word is in Washington that lawmakers could put these guys back to work by Friday. Has Union Pacific made any comment at all about the strike today? They have. Um, you know, UP spokesperson John Bromley, in fact, was up all night uh, monitoring the situation. Of course, they expected it. They've secured the freight and will now just wait and see and hope that Congress uh, can get something resolved because they stand to lose millions of dollars. All right, Molly, we'll check back if there's any change. Thank you. Carol. You bet. Striking railroad employees walked the picket line today outside several train locations. These employees took their turn in front of Union Pacific headquarters downtown. We've had some thumbs up, like I said, some bus drivers waving. It's kind of a, an awkward situation. You'd rather be working, I'm sure, than doing something like this. But. These pigeons were the only things moving at the Burlington Northern Yard. Rail cars are stacked silently in rows. These rail cars will remain idle on these tracks until the dispute ends. Every day they sit here, it costs the railroads millions. Losing money as we speak, right? Um, Congress has started hearings this morning, and um, uh, we feel at this point that's probably the only practical solution to getting a quick resolution to this. So. Uh, we got an 8 to midnight at the Harriman Center. Union members plan to have picketers walking 24 hours a day. Several strike headquarters, like this one, have been set up to organize the effort. Our uh, morale is high. We've had uh, excellent participation by our, our members. Uh, it's obvious that we're on strike with uh, conviction. Employees say the fact the strike has lasted this long is a good sign, but say they want a settlement soon. Lawmakers in Washington may force workers back on the job before the weekend. For Newswatch 7 at 6, I'm Molly Miller. And at noon, what a difference a day makes. Yesterday, railroad workers carried picket signs. Today, they're back to work. Both the Union Pacific and Burlington Northern called back employees to work early this morning. Around 1.30 this morning, Congress passed a resolution ordering workers back on the job. Union officials here say... Their 20-hour strike was a success. Now the contract dispute will be settled by a review board. The way we view it, view it uh, there's all kinds of room for improvement and uh, not too much room for uh, damage. So uh, I guess we uh, view it as a major step for us. There will be a two-month cooling-off period before negotiations begin again. 
News Watch 7's Molly Miller has been covering the strike. She joins us live now and has there been a lot of uh, train movement in and out of town today? Actually, Carol, you'd think there would be, but things are actually going quite slowly. In fact, freight travel is nowhere near normal. UP and BN say it's going to take at least two to three days before everything gets back to where it was before the strike. Okay, um, now what about Amtrak? We've heard that they've suspended operations. Well, they had, they're back um, on. In fact, Amtrak is going to be operating as scheduled. They've got an 11.30 train out of here to Denver. That's going to be on time. They didn't have a train in from Chicago this morning, but they say that everything right now is back on track. All right, back on track. I'm sure a lot of folks like to hear that. Thanks, yeah. Molly. Now, we should also mention that...